Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on the star line by an artist, author, writer, and cartoonist for The New Yorker. His second edition, revised of the book, The Best of the Rejection Collection, 297 cartoons that were too dark, too weird, or too dirty for The New Yorker is now out. We welcome Matthew Diffie. Hey, how you doing? Absolutely great, Matt. Let's go beyond the mic. Now, you've been contributing cartoons to The New Yorker since 1999. Yeah. How many have you sold, and what's your lifetime batting average? You know, I don't know. I, I know it's over 300 that I've had in the magazine over that time, and uh, batting average is very low, but it's par for the course. Uh, <laughs> we, we all do, you know, 10 a week and very lucky to sell one. So 90, if you're really killing it, if you're just on top of your game, usually less than that. As you start looking at these rejects, were there some that you went, oh, no. But then immediately said, oh, that's got to go into the must be in the book pile. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to have this other outlet for those ones. And, and, and these ones are not, I mean, we have a lot of like perfectly reasonable, respectable New Yorker cartoons that get rejected. But these are the ones that we occasionally, you know, they come into our head and we kind of know this is never going to fly in the New Yorker. But we kind of have to draw them anyway. And these are those ones that the New Yorker was totally right to reject. It's a, it's a chance for us just to misbehave a bit and do naughtier, rowdier stuff. So the cartoonist chat rooms <laughs> must be great. Yeah. Yeah. To some extent we do. I used to live in New York. I was there for 12 years. And so we would literally, you know, get together and go out to lunch and swap cartoons ideas with each other. And these are those ones that you would show your fellow cartoonists because they're just outrageous and naughty. But now I think you mostly go through the internet emails and chats and stuff. Matt, what makes drawing so enjoyable for you? I don't know if drawing is enjoyable for me. Honestly, it's uh, it's work. The drawing part of it, to me, I, I, I like to say, it's what people see and what people think of when they think of cartoonists. But most of the work of a cartoonist is actually thinking and very little drawing. Drawing, to me, I like to say, is the end zone dance. It's after you've done all the hard work and then you get to draw just to deliver the joke. I don't ever draw for fun, really, anymore. Sad. But it's, it's a matter of, you know, effectively getting the joke across only. I talked to cartoonist Stephen Pastis recently, yeah. and he's drawing a strip every day while you're drawing a cartoon that may not even ever get in. Right. It's a, he, you know, strip guys that gals that do that, I have a huge amount of respect because I, I've always been scared to try it. Because, yeah, you have to be funny every day. You have to deliver something every day. I just have to be funny, you know, one day a week. And I can, you know, be just cranking out terrible stuff the rest of the time. The only thing is, like, a strip artist does have a, you know, a cast of characters that the audience knows. So there's a little bit of a shorthand that can rely on people knowing this character would say this and therefore it's funny. You know, on the other hand, we, we recreate the world every time. Which I, I like that freedom to be able to go anywhere for the joke, but I think it's just two different forms of, of the same discipline in a way. Are you a pencil first, then ink, or it just depends on what you can grab? You know, my work is all pencil. My very first cartoon I sold to the York, I thought you kind of had to be an ink, so I used a brush and ink. And after that, I was like, can I just do pencil? And the editor was like, sure. So I do a, a, the whole thing in pencil. I start with a light pencil for the sketch, and then uh, I do a really dark pencil for the final arc. Author of the Best of the Rejection Collection, 297 cartoons that were too dark, too weird, or too dirty for the New Yorker, Matthew Diffie is joining us for The Rocking Eight. Eight random questions. Answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. There is no pressure. <clears throat> Favorite barbecue joint in Austin? Franklin's, hands down. You hosted the Steam Powered Hour, a.k.a. Hee Haw for Hipsters <laughs> Off-Broadway. What's your favorite Broadway show? Oh, man. Um, I would say Les Miserables from... 40 years ago. Matt, what's your favorite cartoonist when you were a child? Gary Larson, Farside. Your first tweet was a list of things better than a New York City hot dog. Do you regret having American Gladiators on that list? <laughs> yeah, that didn't age well. <laughs> yeah, I regret it. What do you procrastinate doing? Everything. Especially drawing. I mean, how long does it take you to draw a cartoon? <laughs> I, I, way too long, I would say. I do multiple versions, and I'm like, oh, is this face better than this face? Is this hand right? I, I way overdo it. Matt, if your life was made into a movie, which current star would play you? Hmm, current star that could play me? Obviously, George Clooney. Of course! Best pizza topping. Um, you know, cheese. You gotta keep it simple. Weird, but cheese. 
Who's the person who inspires you most? Oh my goodness. That's a tough one. You know, which person inspires me the most? I would say, you know, I'm going to go way back to my formative years and say Stephen Wright. Very nice. I have a pony. Great album. As far as a joke writer. Can I say two? Sure. I'll say, uh, so since I do art and comedy, I'm going to say Stephen Wright for comedy, and I'm going to say Andrew Wyatt for all the art nerds out there. Which of the cartoons excite you for the future of the business? Oh, man, that's hard. There's so many really great ones. I, I guess I'd have to say Ed Steed, and he's in the book. You have to look him up. Why? Um, he, he kind of is going backwards in, in my mind. Like, he's going way back to really traditional early type of cartooning, where the, the picture is is really doing a lot of the work. I think cartoons over the years have gotten more wordy and almost like sitcom jokey kind of. And and he's really taken it back to just like a, a strong, weird visual. Almost back to, he is English, and I, I wonder if he has like references from Punch Magazine and some other way back when kind of forms of cartooning. So I like what he's doing. But I like so many others. You talked a little bit about this, but how has cartooning changed for the better or the worse in the last 10 years? Oh, man. I guess I guess I just answered it. I think, that, yeah, I think it, it's gotten a little worse. I think there's more people doing it, but there's fewer people that are doing it in its real pure form. A lot of the cartoons that I see now could be tweets. They could be lines from sitcoms. Uh, uh, animated films, many other things. It's time for one big question with author of The Best of the Rejection Collection, 297 cartoons that were too dark, too weird, or too dirty for the New Yorker, Matthew Diffie. Matt, with people's sensitivities so easily riled up, how much harder is it for a cartoonist to get anything sold today? Yeah, it, it's tough. The, the, the hardest thing about getting cartoons sold now is that there's just a lot of cartoonists trying to do it. But yeah, half the, half the topics we able to make jokes about are off the table now. And for me, that's a shame. I, I like to be able to make a joke about anything, as long as it's not mean-spirited. That's the line I won't cross. Other than that, I think it should be all fair game, but you know, as you know, it's hard. Sensitive. People are sensitive now. He likes cheese pizza, Gary Larson, and procrastinates about everything. His book, The Best of the Rejection Collection, 297 cartoons that were too dark, too weird, or too dirty for The New Yorker, the revised second edition, is now out. We thank cartoonist Matthew Diffie for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks a bunch. This is fun. And that, my friends, is the Beyond the Mic Shortcut. <laughs>